I'm saying to you that, you know, we get diagnostic outpatient work, there's therapeutic outpatient work. So this is an outpatient polypectomy, and this is the most common method we'd employ, which would be used with a bipolar electrode, a little burst point electrode. And so you can cut off polyps, and things, ones like this are lovely, easy, you know, laterally or anteriorly or posteriorly placed. You get a lovely view, then you can put a, the only, you can burn the base to try to prevent recurrence. And then the only issue then you have is, and this is the key thing, and I think this is my new mantra actually, is what you were saying about the retained products. We should try and do everything under vision. It's sort of a bit anarchic that we sort of blindly instrument the uterus. It's like in general surgery, in that general surgical practice, we always want to see where we are, but in the uterus, we can just do everything blindly, just put something in there and grab. But here, we do it all under vision, but we have to use a grasper and another pass to actually get the, the um, uh, polyp out. And this is all vaginoscopic. So vaginoscopically in with the electrode, pull the electrode out, take the grasper, and off you go. <coughs> but the nice thing, I hope I can... Sorry, I'm not very familiar with... Ooh. Oh, Mark, I'm not an Apple man. I am not an Apple man, I'm sorry. How do I just show you? Yeah. How do I just get rid of that? Oh, top part, okay. And then you can't get there, basically. That's how I open it. Now, this one. Well done. Yes, I'm getting it. Now, this is the, uh, the shrew clearing action. Again, this is outpatient. This is outpatient. See? So, this is the <coughs> five millimeter device that um, Mark Hamster is speaking to you about. So you can see this polyp, this is a much bigger polyp than the last one I showed you. Now this one with the Versa point will be quite difficult because it's quite difficult to get to the base of the fundal polyp, particularly when it's large, you see? And so, but the nice thing about the morselator is you just literally put it there. And it's also nice, it's not really a technique, you know, it's sort of one of those things where I like to sort of show people it, and I, I, I'm sort of trying to sort of portray some competence. Um, but in essence, I'm just shoving it against the... The, uh, the main thing about it is you must remember not to fall asleep and, and actually put some force against it because otherwise you're just sucking fluid. You know, particularly towards the end as it disappears, you sort of have to just remember to sort of follow the... <coughs> but literally, this is all, and this is all in re real time because I'm not a man of editing things, but I'll fast forward it. But I think in total, it's a three-minute video. So it's three minutes. And this is in the outpatient. This is a big polyp. You see, and you see how quickly it sort of chews it away, and you start to see the corneal recesses at the top now, and um, that's what I say, the point, it dances, you just hold it there and you suck, and then, you know, off you go. I'll try and fast forward a bit more to the end. So I'm gonna break your Apple Mac. Yeah, and then you sort of, and you can see, and then you chew it away. And um, this is a call from Jeff. Uh, uh, this is a call from Jeff. <laughs> this is a call from Jeff. Jeff, Jeff, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, so you can see that, so it's great, it's fantastic. You'd agree, that'd be quite difficult part to remove me out there. You could probably try and grab it, load the diet, the cervix, put some low and grab it blindly. As we discussed, I don't think we should really be doing anything blindly nowadays. And doing things under direct vision is very important. So that just shows you the difference. So, so I hope you get, so the trial I did, my research for, I have to say, did a lot of work on this, so I shouldn't really oh, be stealing his thunder. Uh, <laughs> um, you, know, you know what I, Einstein said? Einstein said, an empty desk is an empty mind. <laughs> the, um, the, uh, so what we did is we randomised between um, the use of the, in the outpatient setting, so it's under uh, uh, IG, IG, yes, yeah. Uh, we randomised basically, um, I've got the samples right now, with my slides in front of me. We randomised between what I showed you with the inverse point electro, and the morse later. Yes. And so what we did was we just simply, any woman that had a polyp, it didn't matter if it was for fertility reasons, for any, any bleeding reasons, we weren't bothered about the indication. And we randomised them to either having removed with the uh, morse later, the true clear morse later, or the burst point electro. And um, Vera sent me this, uh, <laughs> these slides. The, uh, we, we in AGL in Washington, we were lucky enough to win what's called the Golden Hysteroscope. You've heard of this. Only the Americans got a golden hysteroscope. The man, the man with the golden gun. And it's bizarre, I thought it was just like a thing, an award, a plaque, but they actually give you a gold hysteroscope. <laughs> and there it is. It's a fully functional Olympus hysteroscope, gold plated. I don't know who I'll use it on. No, I'll to play. Don't be the gold hysteroscope. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, we have one, so so, so there. <laughs> but, uh, but you can win it every year, so you know if you think of a nice hysteroscopy paper, then 
and you want to go off this scary thing, then do it. Um, we published, we published in, um, uh, it's just come out, and actually you can get, now's your opportunity to get it for free, yeah? Because apparently it's editor's pick, it's, so apparently you can get, you know now there's this free, free access, so you can actually go onto the site and get it, yeah, without, if you haven't got access, and the, the, that video I showed you is linked onto there, so you can get that, so that paper's just come out, and so what we did was very quickly, because I know we will get tired, basically we just wanted to see, we've already done a big study, which that data will come out, the op trial on effectiveness, but in terms of treating symptoms. But in this case, we're just interested in the feasibility, the safety, acceptability, pain scores, and completeness, success in removing the polyps. So what we did was we basically randomized women, and they were allocated uh, to oscillator here, or to reception. We had no withdrawals, it was great because there was no real follow-up in the We just randomised and did the procedure and asked them to fill in a questionnaire. So we got a complete follow-up, which is great. Uh, don't worry too much about this. This is just, you know, in any trial, you always show some background characteristics just to show that it's a you know, pretty standard population. 56 resections, there were, 50, sorry, mean age 56, 58 in the Morse group. They were all, the groups are sort of well-balanced. Uh, we looked at there was some fundable polyps, some non-fundable. But again, they were balanced between the groups. So, just the, act, the main headlines then. So, treatment time, again, this is in the office. So, this is important, as we've seen earlier, the ablations. Um, the median treatment time is sort of 10 minutes, 12 seconds with the first point, versus 5 minutes, 28 seconds. So, you can say that's well, both short procedures, but in the office, with your, in the, in the lithotomy position, undergoing a procedure, obviously the shorter the procedure is, I think you would agree that it's important. We also looked, and to be honest, we powered the trial based on treatment time, so we powered it based on a third treatment reduction, but we got nearer, nearer to a half, and so that was statistically significant. But interestingly, our secondary outcome measures, which I'm showing you now, all reached kind of, uh, statistical significance as well. So we looked at pain scores, and uh, uh, the, 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 ba the baseline pain score, we just asked women how much pain you've got now, basically. Um, and the, 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 some of the women were 8 out of 10, 8 millimetres out of 100 in pain before we started. But it was just to make sure the groups were balanced. But actually during the procedure, the mean pain scores were 52 millimetres, so about 5 centimetres, versus um, 4 centimetres with the Morse later, which was statistically significant. Now whether that's clinically significant, it's hard to say, and you'd have to decide. But certainly there was a statistical difference in pain score. Uh, Post-procedures, they were, they, were, they, were, they were pretty similar. Um, the big trial I told you about the op trial, we randomised women to removing polyps in the outpatient versus inpatient. This is just for comparability. We got a mean pain score of 45, so that's four and a half centimetres, so 45 millimetres, on a visual analogue scale with outpatient polypectomy. Now that's, this is not diagnostic hysteroscopy, diagnostic hysteroscopy would be two probably. So that's four and a half, and as you can see the previous slide I showed you from the True Clear study, we were getting 52. We didn't really do any more slates in the op trial because we didn't, it wasn't available to us then. But now you can see this seems to be not only quicker, but associated with less pain. Mm. Acceptability, well thankfully both procedures were acceptable. If you take unacceptable, we only had one patient that found the procedure is unacceptable, so both very acceptable procedures. But if you dichotomise here and cut off between, you, you can see the fairly acceptable and unacceptable is not really acceptable, then you will have greater acceptability, the odds of acceptability is eight and a half times greater with the more slater. So it appears to be quicker, less painful, more acceptable. And then the other thing is to look at other surgical outcomes, and I won't go through all of them with you because I say you can access the paper. Um, but interestingly, the advantage of the, the thing I love about the alpha scope, the versa point, it's very small, you can do vaginoscopy, you can go in, it's a nice long scope, beautiful scope. You have to get used to the um, offset um, distal lens with the more slater. Um, but if you look here at the amount of speculum usage, and it was greater in the section group, the amount of cervical <laughs> dilatation was similar, the amount of cervical anesthesia was similar. And that's because the whole problem with the bursa point is you can remove things beautifully, but getting the, the lesions out can be quite difficult. And then you have to put them in and dilate, and then eventually you might not come out under vision, and then you might have to start blind the instrument in the uterus. And as I was saying to you, I think that should become a thing of the past blind uterine instrumentation. So, even though it's a slightly larger diameter, five millimeters, it's not been requiring any more anesthesia. And indeed, we did a lot of vaginoscopic procedures with the um, 
more later. So I think you know without what you saw earlier that uh, Mark, Mark Gowan showed you. And then this is the slide that I think that's the most compelling evidence to me. In the OP trial, we showed exactly the same data as here. In the OP trial, 18% of polyps we couldn't fully remove. What I mean by that, you might get a bit of it off, you might cut it off, but you wouldn't retrieve it. So you had to remove a polyp successfully, you had to remove the whole thing and you had to retrieve it from the uterine cavity. But if you didn't do that, we considered it a failure. In the OP trial, it was 82% success, so 18% failed. And we're getting very similar here, you see 83% in the resection group. So again, that appears to be generalizable across the OP trial, even though this is sort of, I mean, from two centers this study, my OP trial was 30 centers. But if you look here at the, the Morse later, we only had one case where we didn't complete the procedure. So that's a huge difference, 98% success rate as opposed to 83%. So it seems to be not only quicker, less painful, more acceptable, but it appears to be more successful. And that's really all that I was going to say about it. That slide covers all that. So it's an interesting paper. It's, it's quite clear. I hope you'll be able to have an opportunity to download it. Well, I think going from diagnostic hysteroscopy to therapeutic hysteroscopy, yeah, this is a great technology. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, may I have time for some questions? Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, what do we want to or not? It's not this, otherwise you try to translate. It's... Is she? Is this? <laughs> <laughs> it's... It's <laughs>